uh, Sam Dolan, I'm going to talk about implication learning for self driving cars. Um, yeah, so mostly I'm going to talk about uh, the Choker Net paper. This was a paper out of uh, Waymo Research uh, last year, 2018. Um, but first, I'll, uh, I'll frame this talking about a little bit about some different approaches to uh, autonomous vehicles or self driving cars, and then um, some lessons to take away. A little louder. All right, I'll, I will try. Uh, next time we'll get a mic. We're so sorry. So I don't want to get too much into the history of self-driving cars, uh, but I just want to talk about um, a couple of approaches to contrast with uh, chauffeur net. Uh, so one thing, one thing you can do is um, you can try to do an end-to-end learning system for self-driving cars. Uh, NVIDIA in 2016 had a paper that demonstrated this. So um, this is kind of conceptually the simplest approach. Um, so they had uh, three cameras, uh, left, right, and center, and these all go through a, a convolutional neural net and uh, directly output uh, the angle of the steering wheel. So kind of directly from the image inputs, you're, you're learning how to steer, how to drive. And later this was extended to uh, speed control, acceleration, and braking as well. And this is kind of really appealing because, you know, there's this idea that uh, neural networks are, are universal functional approximators, you should be able to uh, just a, a, attach a network between any inputs and outputs and um, optimize the whole system in the end, and it's very simple. Uh, but this does have some, have some drawbacks. Um, in 2017 and 2018, there were a few different papers uh, investigating uh, NVIDIA's model and um, you can see here, uh, this paper from 2018, Deep Explorer demonstrated this adversarial attack that if you take um, uh, an input image and just keep it exactly the same but, but darken it, suddenly uh, the car, rather than following the road, wants to veer into the guardrail. So this is uh, a very bad uh, failure mode uh, in this context. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, the end-to-end -end approach, um, it's susceptible to generalization failures like this, and um, it's not interpretable. So, um, so you, you can do some things like uh, you can highlight uh, what parts of the image are relevant to the, the model telling you to turn left or right. Uh, but if you have a failure like this, it's kind of hard to say like what's the single uh, reason for this. Um, so it would help to have some intermediate uh, representation of the data. Um, yeah, I also want to, want to contrast with um, reinforcement learning approaches without uh, going too much into um, the variety of, of ways that you can try to do this. Um, so reinforcement learning is kind of uh, a counterpart to imitation learning. Uh, so in, in reinforcement learning, you're specifying the problem, you're saying what are the rewards, what are the costs, so what should you do without telling the model uh, how to do it. And um, so I think one uh, compelling application of reinforcement learning that I want to mention uh, from last year, there was a startup called Wave that demonstrated that um, if you uh, just put a human in a, in a car that uh, has learned nothing yet and just let it try to follow a track um, and the human you know, intervenes when it's about to go off the road and you know, gives it feedback, gets it, puts it back on course in just 15 to 20 minutes, you can um, get pretty good road tracking behavior. So I, I thought that was uh, pretty compelling that um, reinforcement learning does work well and like you're, you're not even necessarily going to run into this pitfall of you know, high sample complexity, which is one of the uh, familiar problems with it, that you need a lot of points to, a lot of data points to train. Um, so what are issues with re uh, reinforcement learning generally? Well, it can be uh, rigid and kind of struggle with like human aspects. <coughs> yeah, so this is kind of a silly example that you can see the difference between like, you know, training using the human model and kind of this misspecification of the problem where uh, you, we've like forgotten to specify the rules that you can't run the baseball to the mound. Um, and this may seem silly, but it's actually very re relevant for self-driving cars because it's, a, it's actually extremely difficult to specify the reward structure of um, you know, driving on the road with other cars because 
there are a lot of uh, complicated cases like um, you can think of four-way stops or merging on the freeway and you know humans uh, typically like make eye contact like do a little wave or you know move slowly to make sure the other person sees you and there are a lot of things that it's tricky for uh, a reinforcement learning model to pick up on yeah so um, we're going to use the imitation learning approach um, or Schofernet Schof uh, uses imitation learning, which means that we have uh, an expert policy, examples of expert policy to learn from, uh, a behavior to clone, rather than uh, rewards to incentivize. So Schofernet is offline imitation learning, which means that we have just a data set of human driving examples. We're not allowed to you know, query what would the expert human driver do in this case. Um, I just wanted to mention that if, if you do have that, if you do have like an oracle for what would expert behavior be in this situation, um, that's online imitation learning and there are approaches to deal with that uh, such as a dagger or data set aggregator. Um, yeah, what you do in that case is um, you, you build up uh, additional data points for your supervised learning by um, you know, sometimes sampling from the expert and sometimes sampling from your learning policy. Uh, to make it trajectories for you, so. um, Yeah, so what are issues with imitation learning? Uh, the main one seems to be error compounding. So you can imagine if, you're, uh, if, you, if your model is trying to follow a track and uh, at one time step your epsilon to the right or where you should be, that might be fine. But if your epsilon to the right uh, for 100 consecutive time steps, these errors accumulate and you might start to run off the track. Um, and then you won't be able to recover because there's this training bias towards um, states that you've observed that are in your training data and human drivers typically don't, you know, veer to the side of the road and have to recover. Um, so the way to deal with this is you need some sort of simulation or data augmentation. And uh, in the NVIDIA end-to-end -end learning paper, the way they did this was um, with uh, translations of the, image, of the images to, to simulate uh, like being slightly off-center of where the human was. I think that was imperfect. Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to say again, imitation learning and reinforcement learning are kind of complementary. It's, you know, what to do versus how to do something. And I think um, something that's interesting to me is, you know, how do we combine these or, or, or you know, uh, it seems like in complicated tasks, some combination of the two might work well. And I think that's sort of what's happening in, in Schoenberg and to some extent as we'll see. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to go into these ideas individually, but I, I wanted to say like, what are the key ideas of Schoenberg and um, how do they make imitation learning work? Um, so the first idea is to create a really detailed intermediate representation of the state of the world uh, using camera inputs. Um, the second idea is to not just have, you know, a basic loss function for, you know, matching steering uh, angle and, and so on, but to add a lot of terms to your loss function to incentivize kind of expected uh, behavior. So this is what I, I, I kind of think of, of as pseudo reinforcement learning. Uh, and the third idea is to is the specific type of data augmentation that they do, which is um, uh, perturbation of uh, human trajectories. Um, and uh, I think having this in intermediate representation helps uh, helps with um, being able to, to generate like high quality simulated. So what is the data that they used? Um, so there are, they used 30 million uh, examples. And you can see kind of the structure of uh, these examples. That, uh, that there's a red dot, which, which is the current position of the vehicle. Uh, the white dots are past positions. And you're predicting the green dots, which are future positions. Um, and then uh, based on these predictions, you have like an additional controller to, um, to uh, map to uh, steering. Um, so this is about 60 total days of real-time data, uh, and so I think, I mean, we could do 
even more than that, but uh, this is already more than in India. In the AU, it's only uh, three, about three days of uh, training. <clears throat> yeah, so what is the this representation of the state of the world? So um, they have um, a roadmap, they have a speed limit, routes, and the current location of the car past location of the car, and there, there are two representations that they, that they use. One is this kind of uh, point representation, or like single pixel of these images, and one is um, the bounding box, so like where the, the boundary is of the, of the vehicle. And um, you can kind of see in, in, in this image that um, some of these are treated as static vehicle features, and some of them as uh, sequences of discretized uh, time features. So, um, for example, uh, you remember the whole history of, uh, of traffic lights, so maybe you know like when the light is about to turn green, or about to change, and you remember the, the past positions of other vehicles on the roads. Um, yeah, so this helps with uh, interpretability and uh, helps us uh, do high quality simulation. Um, yeah, so what do we do with these histories of, of states or histories of you know, locations of other cars and things like that? Uh, these go into an RNN. Um, so here, here's the, uh, the global structure of the model. Um, we, we generate this uh, set of features, uh, current snapshot of the state of the world, and uh, a list of past states of the world. And we feed this into an RNN, which predicts um, the uh, the next uh, point location of the car, as well as the next uh, bounding box for the boundaries of the car. So, um, what is our loss function? So, um, yeah, and, and we, we also get a, an angle, which is uh, the, the heading or direction of the car. So, we, we build three uh, terms for our loss function using these. Um, so, uh, what do we do with our uh, predicted uh, single pixel uh, location of the car? Um, so this is a probability distribution over pixels, and we just um, uh, take uh, cross entropy of, uh, of this probability distribution with the, with the true value, or with the, the true distribution. Um, we also have an array of probabilities over pixels for the bounding box or like a heat map, and um, so we, we take one loss or absolute value of uh, the difference um, in angular pennies. Yeah, so the second idea that, that I uh, mentioned is that we need to augment our data using perturbations. So I, I think the way that they did this, did this was, was pretty interesting. You know, they moved the location uh, to left to right slightly, and also, um, uh, change the heading of the car. They said between minus 60 degrees and plus 60 degrees, which seems like very drastic to me. But I think this is mitigated somewhat by the fact that they um, they threw out trajectories if they um, if they have a turn radius which is smaller than the minimum turn radius of the actual car. Um, yeah. So with these perturbed data. Uh, Perturbed trajectories, the model should learn to be able to get back on track. Um, and they weighted these perturbed examples from one tenth of the actual data ones. Yeah, so the third idea is to um, augment the loss function using domain knowledge. So this is like what I think of as pseudo reinforcement learning. Um, so we want to penalize collisions, we want to penalize going off the road. We want to penalize um, getting out of the uh, kind of expected trajectory, or so like being kind of more to the center, like out of the center of the lane. Um, so we'll, we'll we'll build these into the loss function. But I just wanted to say that like uh, you can't really do this very effectively if you don't have uh, good data augmentation because like these aren't scenarios that you see in training data. You don't have examples of like humans going off the road or hitting cars and things like that. Yeah, so um, we get these terms which are just taken from 
the overlap of our predicted bounding box heat map with other vehicles and with the road and with the uh, expected uh, lane trajectory. Yeah, so actually here's another idea which is helpful, is um, maybe take another network and train it on a related task which shares some of the same points. So um, they have another RNN that uh, predicts the locations of other cars on the road, and they train this using the same features, and um, so these RNNs are kind of sharing the same featureizing uh, front end. Um, so this helps us to uh, higher quality features. Um, yeah, so I thought this was interesting. They don't include future locations of other cars uh, directly into the model itself, but it, it is this kind of co-training, which um, helps improve the shared weights. Yeah, so another like detail that's uh, kind of thought-provoking is that, um, so we're doing this kind of multitask learning. We have um, some terms in the loss function which are uh, to imitate the expert, and we have some terms in the loss function which are incentivizing expected behavior. And typically, what you do is you um, you weight these by some you know combination of coefficients to get the right mixture between between these to get the best results. But actually, what they do is um, stochastically, like with probability uh, probability p, I think I forget exactly what p was, but sometimes they set this to zero. So sometimes you're learning uh, based purely on the environment, and you're not um, you have no recourse to the expert behavior. So this seemed to be important, actually. Yeah. So they call this imitation dropout. <coughs> yeah. So this might be a little bit hard to read, but they did an ablation analysis to um, decide which of these um, aspects of the model are important. Um, and they uh, evaluated on three tasks. One is uh, nudging past a parked car, one is recovering from a perturbation to the trajectory, and one is slowing for uh, a car that's moving slowly. And uh, so um, M0 is just like simple imitation learning. Uh, M2 in the center column is um, adding state augmentation and augmenting the loss function. And M4 on the right is um, using imitation dropout. And uh, uh, so you can see that you, you really need most of these bells and whistles to get uh, the best results on these tasks. Um, yeah, so I have some videos of uh, the results, and I would encourage you to. Oh no, I think it's right on. Okay. Yeah, so these are GIFs which are supposed to. All right, well, so I'll just tell you uh, what happens. Uh, but yeah, I encourage you to look at um, Waymo Research has a site where you can view these. But uh, yeah, so this contrasts like M0, the most basic imitation learning model, with uh, M4, the final model. And um, basically what happens is M0 um, stops when there is a parked car that's overlapping with the road and is unable to uh, to go past it because um, it doesn't have training examples which overlap enough with the situation, I guess. Uh, but the final model is able to um, go slightly off the road and go around it uh, for recovering from a perturbation. Um, M0 uh, goes, uh, if, you, if you nudge it to the right of it, it just keeps going to the right, it goes off the road and stops and is unable to recover M4 successfully recovers, and um, slowing for a slow car. Uh, for some reason, M0 just stops if, if there's a slow car and is unable to keep going, but M4 successfully um, slows down and maintains this buffer of space between itself and um, Yeah, uh, sorry that I didn't have the animated versions. Yeah, so uh, just a couple of remarks about um, what I think the takeaways are from this paper. Um, yeah, uh, creative data augmentation was, was really key here. Um, 
yeah, e even seemingly like something basic, like uh, let's just take these trajectories and just take the center point and Move it slightly and smoothly, carefully, and creative loss function engineering helped a lot. So the final loss function ended up including like 10 or 11 terms. So they really thought about, you know, what are the different aspects of this that are important and what's the right combination of them. And um, I think it's important that, you know, they blended multiple approaches. They had some losses that were, you know, had to do with obtaining the expert. They had some losses. Uh, loss terms that um, had to do with the environment or the behavior that they wanted to incentivize. Um, and they used this imitation dropout uh, technique. So it's a creative sort of uh, approach to multitask. And um, yeah, it seems important that they combine those two elements. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's all I have.